there, Wind Energy students. Dr. John Shroggy here, and we're getting started now on the eighth module of our course. We're practically done. You may have already read the pages in the textbook, and you know that this is a chapter that kind of provides a overview of some of the challenges associated with modeling. And we're going to get into a little bit more detail about modeling than necessarily your book does. And kind of, um, well, if you've taken other classes with me, you know modeling is a topic that I have a lot of interest in and that is a very nuanced topic and yet is related to a lot of things that are uh, key to the field of atmospheric sciences and environmental sciences and energy and so on. Not to mention, of course, many of you either have already taken or will be taking my Energy 301 course, which is called Modeling Electrical Load and Yield. And obviously, in a course with a title like that, modeling becomes a key topic in the course. And so we're going to be learning kind of a little bit more than what the textbook talks about here, but we will be setting up things that you'll be learning in other courses quite a bit, too. Now, if we're going to have this discussion in this module about modeling, clearly this is a term that we're going to need to have a good understanding of. And if I were looking for a dictionary definition of modeling, I would be disappointed. It's actually a difficult term to come up with a definition of. And actually, I was pretty impressed with the definition that your textbook comes up with where they said modeling is devising a representation of a phenomenon or a system. I like that definition because it is so vague. I mean, there's really only one key word in here, and this is this idea of it being a representation. You are making something that is a representation of some phenomenon or some system. Uh, that could be anything from, like, in meteorology, we might have a model that represents the way the atmosphere is behaving to, like, a model of the electrical grid or a model of a wind farm or something like that. And we'll see examples of all of these things. In general, these representations are going to be a simplified version of the real thing. So they will be equations, maybe. The model might be equations that represent what the real system, in this case maybe the wind around our wind turbine, are doing, but it simplifies the matter. It is a it has certain assumptions behind it, certain simplifications that have made it easier to work with, but it still must retain the ability to behave like the real system, at least within the parameters of uh, what you have specified the model doing. And so like our simplified equation maybe that describes what the wind is doing around our wind turbine still has to be able to represent winds around the wind turbine. I mean, if it comes up with unrealistic answers, then it's not a very good model. But this idea of it being a representation can mean lots of different things. I mean, if you just throw around the word model to someone who has no experience in any of this stuff, they might be thinking of something like a model train. And I'm actually pretty supportive of that idea. A model train is a type of model. It is a model in the sense that it is a representation of a real system. This thing right here on the slide here is not a train. It is a representation of a train, but it still retains some of the ability to behave like a real train track system. Right? The train goes down the track. It can hook together with other cars. Now, there are simpler models of a train, I like, in Introduction to Meteorology class, I like to show them examples of, like, Thomas the Train cars, okay, little toy trains that, like, a toddler would play with. Or there's very complicated models, like the one you're seeing in the picture here, where they have lots of details, but no matter what, it's still not a train. It is able to retain some of the behavior of a train, like going down the track, like hooking together with other cars, like starting and stopping maybe realistic ideas of the speed of the train scaled to the size of the model and so on. But it's not a train. But that doesn't mean you can't learn real things about real trains from this model. For example, we often use these kinds of models to teach us things about what the real system can and can't do. In this case, for example, this train car is very accurately representing a train derailment and accident where 
the model correctly was not able to, well, the model in its simulation anyway, was not able to go around this bend and got rear-ended by another train or something. I don't remember exactly what all happens in the video that you're seeing. But it is a model. It is a model. It's showing us something that is retaining behavior of the real system. We're learning something about how real trains derail by watching the model train derail. This is an example of what we call physical modeling. A physical modeling or a toy model is, um, you know, where there's actually, you know, made out of materials a model, usually smaller than the real thing, where you can work with, although it wouldn't have to be smaller. I mean, you could talk about, like, models of molecules, where you have, you know, the kind of spring and ball type mo model of a molecule that you'd be looking at. But anytime we work with that kind of model, we can be learning something about the real system using this simplified version. Wind tunnels are a classic example of where we put physical models into a wind tunnel to learn about the performance of a wing or a wind turbine or the design of a, the body of a car or something like that. They are physical models being put into an environment and they respond in ways, they behave in ways similar to what the real system is going to do. Mathematical, um, physical models are cool. There's lots of cool things you can do with physical models. I, of course, come from an atmospheric science background, and while there is such a thing as physical models in atmospheric science, they're kind of more a teaching tool. By and large, we are more interested in mathematical models. Mathematical models are a, the description of a system, like the atmosphere, or a profile of the winds, or something like that, that is based on mathematical concepts and mathematical language. We're going to be using things like algorithms and equations to describe what a system is doing. Now, this might be an equation that's actually based on like the physics, where like we are modeling a system based on, well, we know how the system will change because we know the magnitude of all the forces acting on the system, and then we can apply Newton's second law, F equals MA, and we can project forward where the system is going. That's a type of model. That's a type of mathematical model. Or it might be a system based on statistics. Like, we know how the system behaved in the past. In the past, we know how much wind power we produced under these conditions. So therefore, when we have these conditions again, we can use the behavior of the past to make uh, projections about how much we are modeling uh, how much power is being modeled by the system here. Just to give you some examples of equations that we've seen so far this semester, which really were types of models, how about the log wind profile? The log wind profile, as you might remember, was an equation. It was the u as a function of height, the wind speed as a function of height, and it had a whole bunch of stuff in it. This is a mathematical model. It is simulating in a simplified way. The, the real wind profile is very complicated all kinds of things are happening, not to mention it changes with respect to time. But by making certain assumptions, like the wind's pro profile wasn't changing with respect to time, and, oh, I don't even remember what else, the flow was, um, well, the log wind profile, the layer that it was happening in was statically neutral, and I forget what all the other assumptions were, but by making a bunch of assumptions, we came up with a model, an equation, that describes what the wind profile was doing. It's a good win. It's a good mathematical model. It has errors. We'll learn all about errors and stuff like that in the time to come. But as long as the conditions that we apply the model are appropriate, this might be a really good model to be using to describe a wind profile. Or, for example, if the conditions are different, like if the atmosphere was statically stable, then you might have something different, like the log linear wind profile. Okay, that's another model a slightly more complicated model of the wind profile under a specific set of situations. In that case, you might remember it was when it was statically stable and all that kind of good stuff. But it's a model. And just like any other model, it's going to have input, it's going to have output, it's going to have errors. We're going to learn about what makes this all a model. Um, another example of a model we have seen so far was the N.O. Jensen model of a wake. This was a mathematical representation of the wind speed at different distances downstream from a wind turbine. 
and was based on a variety of assumptions, some of which we didn't get into really in this course, but there's a, a, a set of assumptions that made this the correct tool for the job under certain conditions. We'll have to learn about how you decide what model to use and so on, but it's an example of a model. It's a mathematical representation using mathematical concepts and mathematical language as a way of representing a real process, a real system in the Earth's atmosphere. Those were all just simple little equations that kind of describe the physics. There are, there are statistical models, which are a type of mathematical model, where like, for example, in this one, we have data about the past showing for different temperatures in Omaha how much electrical demand there was. And then based on that, we could fit a curve to the data, not particularly well in this particular case, but you could fit a curve through the data to make an estimate of how much power would be needed in Omaha based on the temperature in Omaha. There's no physics or anything involved in this. It's purely statistics. We're using the past performance of the system, in this case, the electrical grid and how it related to the weather, to make predictions about the future performance of the system. There's also a whole class of so-called numerical models. And numerical models are based on the physics of the situation. The laws, the second law of motion, the first law of thermodynamics, whatever equations that you learned in like a general physics class that apply to a particular situation, we're going to be basing a calculation about what's going on in that. Uh, like in this example, which we're going to see again in the next lecture, um, we are making a model of how a rocket will fly. Okay, at every step of the way, it's being computed what the wind speed is, and I'm sorry, what the speed of the rocket is, and the height of the rocket, so on, is purely based on the physics of it. Okay? This is not based on like past performance of other rockets, it's being based on Newton's laws and laws of thermodynamics and so on. And these kind of numerical models will be the story of how like most weather prediction is doing, but that'll be the topic of the next lecture. Now, before we get into the nitty gritty, of the f workflow of a model, let's actually answer two quick questions. Question one, you know, in some ways that pinwheel that's been in the background of these slides, that's kind of an example of a blank model. Statistical, mathematical, numerical, or physical. That little pinwheel back there, if the wind was blowing, that thing would spin, what kind of model is that? Make a choice from those four options, get a little feedback before you move on to question two.